I liked this idea that I could take what sort of already existed and turn it into my work. I think that's probably this na naive idea that art or being an artist has to be original, which is also nonsense. Artists use material and whether that material already exists as an artwork or is in a tube of paint, I don't know, you move with what you've got and try and change it into something that you can call your own. The deflated sculptures, uh, I think that was in 2009, which took Jeff Koons' rabbit from 1986, which is like a highly polished stainless steel inflatable toy. As a Jeff Koons, it's completely full of air, and, uh, but as, a, as a, an object, it's clear that occasionally the air will come out of this, be it a balloon or a, an inflatable toy. Um, so it was possible to play with this idea of deflating an object. And we made this sculpture in five different versions, five different deflations, two of which are standing, three are lying down. It was just when the market kind of crashed. So it was read as some sort of comment on whether it be the art market or the stock market or any kind of market. That I had clearly no control over, but it just sort of was a nice lead into the idea of this the bursting of a bubble and uh, I don't even think about the copyright issues when it's probably going to become more problematic for artists or musicians or anyone creative to, to actually take anything that already existed and play around with it which is weird really when that's what's been happening for centuries forever probably even cavemen I'm sure they copied the drawings of the of the guys from the next village and just changed them a little bit. Jeff Coombs actually went to see the exhibition that I had in New York and wrote in the guest book, just like mine, which I thought was quite nice. I, I think it was because I probably looked at artists like Richard Prince or Jeff Coombs or Robert Gober who were working in the late 80s, early 90s, and it was something that you would see in magazines. So this is what we all were interested in, what was happening now. And it was maybe only after seeing that kind of work and thinking about what they were doing that I looked at artists from the generation before. And then through the 60s and 70s, or mainly the 70s, you, you kind of, I stumbled across, uh, across um, conceptual art. And it, I think also it was a moment where, I mean, when you finish art school and you've not really got any money or even the opportunity to have a studio, that when you realise it's possible just to have a sheet of A4 paper and type a few words on it and it can still be seen as art, then there's something special about that. Because maybe it was a similar moment that we found ourselves in, in Glasgow at that time where you would... Uh, occasionally be invited to make an exhibition but there was there was money through the British Council to get the artist to where it happened to be the exhibition somewhere in Europe but not for any work to be shipped plus we didn't have money anyway to make things so you would take a few ideas with you and fabricate them wherever you were so it, well, it became that where the context and the idea took over from the actual work so you could uh, you could move quite easily and your work was just with you all the time and then whatever it, a text on the wall or something on a piece of paper or painting things or whatever, that video, I mean all of these things you could just take with you on the plane. Um, so that's probably why that generation of artists have been important to me. So a lot of the things that I, uh, I tend to do I find in catalogues or uh, mainly catalogues or artist books where you find a little glitch in the whatever the history of that particular piece might be and maybe move along with it that way and I decided to make a kind of alternative version of the photographic documentation of the Sunset Strip. I didn't even think too much about it I just thought I could go and I could uh, take this idea that Ed Ruscher had had and uh, employ a slight twist, which would be not to photograph the buildings on the street, but to photograph the roads that led away from it. Um, so it would directly reference his, but not be the same as his. 
it all sort of worked in one take. I'm sure he spent a long time documenting this very carefully and has even since re-photographed the street. Um, but it wasn't so important for me to do that. I just, it was this, just this moment, just this idea that I realised I could do it all in an afternoon and have this, this work. I did have a car, but I thought it was nice to do it completely opposite to Edruche. So I got the bus to the Sunset Strip and I used an old camera with a black and white film in and I, I just documented all of the off streets. So I photographed the spaces in between. You could see the edges of buildings, but it was really the roads that led away from that. So in a way it was, it was the same, but it was completely opposite to what he'd done. He was or is so such an important uh, artist in relationship to artist books. He's just someone that's there, is kind of available and everything makes kind of sense, whether it be 26 fire stations or everything that you can think of from his books, you can make an easy twist to turn it into something that documents your own interests and your own life, but relates directly to what he was doing or maybe what he still is doing. Even abstract painting that's supposedly coming from wherever, the soul, I don't know, I don't actually believe that. Because they tend to, especially not now, there's so much of this painting that, I mean, the artist has to have seen what's been done before if they're doing monochrome paintings or whatever it is they're doing. Um, so there's, it's all existed generally and uh, that's why it's super difficult to be unique just to embrace the idea of not or twist it so you can be in terms of art and humor it's maybe it's just something that we're not expecting to see in uh, in art and whether it's radical, I don't even know. But I don't actually go out of my way to use humour. I mean, it's just sort of there. It's just something that you, you either want to employ and you just do it by complete chance. Um, or that I think also a lot of people seem to see art as being very, not necessarily serious, but um, that you need to look at things in a specific way to understand them and that humour might not necessarily traditionally have a place in the art world. I think it's really that we just we just um, expect something else from art and not maybe not humour or comedy. We just maybe don't want to accept that it's just part of life and life is um, all we've got really and art's no different to that. Everything sort of falls in together. So humour has as much of a place in it as anything else. At art school I did a course called uh, Environmental Art, which is probably a course that if you know any other artist that went through Glasgow School of Art and they're still working today, they probably also did the same course. What was good about this particular course is that we didn't really have to do anything. I mean that sounds... we did have to do... we did have to do something but it wasn't important in what direction that was. You didn't have to paint unless you wanted to, you didn't have to, you could do whatever you wanted. Um, and the one thing that was kind of, uh, we were encouraged to, to think about was uh, the context in which our work would be seen. And that context would be important to the work and how people viewed it. So I, I guess that's something that's perhaps, or what, I guess there's a lot of things, but that particular thing is something that stayed with me. So you're, I'm kind of, not always, but often interested in seeing how something can work in, in relationship to the context that the ex exhibition or whatever it might be will be seen. Um, so I suppose that was one thing that stayed with me. Exhibit Model 2 was triggered mainly through budget constraints and this idea of creating some kind of archive and thought that perhaps I could make an exhibition just using the documentation. Mainly installation shots from other exhibitions that I've done so you could make a new exhibition using old exhibitions. So when I, when I look at the work I don't 
or this particular work, I don't, I don't see it or try not to look at it as individual things that you're seeing in the image, but as a, as a new work again. And sort of everything is, uh, I guess, specifically done for here, knowing the exact shape of every room and how corners will change the look of a work. Also the fact that it's all black and white and knowing that most galleries tend to have a grey floor and a white ceiling with white light. So it, you almost don't notice that the things are in black and white. I mean, if this would be colour, it would there'd just be way too many things happening. And you wouldn't get this effect of the, the floor kind of floating into the floor of the photograph or the wallpaper, which is basically a digital print in the same way that most photographs are these days. This particular work does reference its kind of self itself and the idea of the possibilities of making an exhibition and what an exhibition can be. Often I've, I've made things and people kind of question whether it can be art or not and that's fine again it's like depending on where you do the exhibition and who's going to come and see it. Um, so of course you can't think too much about one or the other. Um, you just do what you do and you understand that some people are going to like it and other people are going to hate it. It's, it's kind of this idea that if you know, there's not really much of a point doing it. If you know why you're doing it and what it exactly it is, then why even make it visible? Because you know the answer. But it's more that you're kind of still attempting to find what the answer might be that makes it interesting.